you everyone for uh, coming to the session. Um, it's my uh, pleasure to introduce Joel with uh, the bio that he wrote of himself. <laughs> <laughs> but what else will frighten me for me? So Joel is a long-time uh, veteran of Silicon Valley. He began his career in customer support, then worked in QA, product marketing and product management roles, before discovering his knack of helping teams get from point A to point B. And since then, he's been doing project management for the last 15 years. He has industry experience ranging from consumer electronics to enterprise big data, broad knowledge of all the interworkings of successful technology solutions, and the people needed to make them happen. His motto is better people, better teams, better world, because he has a profound belief that by working at the individual level, you can change every level of the process to make the world truly a better place. And make sure to check out his blog, The Gorilla Coach. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Well, thank you, everybody. I hope we have a lot of fun today. Um, please don't get too comfortable in your seats. You will be moving. <laughs> All right, so first thing I want to do is, as we go into the introduction of this, I want to give you a warning. This is not an effective Agile conversation. Bob, so glad I caught you. Now good time to talk? Uh, not really, I'm kind of working. This is urgent. I need the status for the database schema. Is it green? Well, we should be. There are some issues with Bob, 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 Bob. I have to report to the Scrum of Scrums. I get 30 seconds for the entire project. You're either red, yellow or green. It's that simple. So, you're green then, right? I believe so. Great. Now, what about that new backlog item from the product, product owner? Have you, had, have you finished estimating? Well, we only got it yesterday and only just began to review the asks. We need to talk to the product owner and we need to set up a test environment to uh, run a thorough set of tests before we can figure it out. <clears throat> Product owners in Vegas at a customer meeting. Uh, how long is that test environment going to take? Well, it'll take about three days to set up the environment, at least two days to run the test, um, and then we'll have to analyze the result. You know, I just don't have enough information to get started. I'm going to need more data. Bob, Bob, this is a critical customer feature. We need to know now. Come on, you've done this stuff a hundred times before. You got a rough idea. You think you can do it, right? Well, on paper, sure, Bob. Great, great, that's all I need to hear. We don't need to worry about the details right now. Those details are not important. We'll figure them out later. I'll let the product owner know you're on board. Don't you just love good communication? The true sharing of ideas and coming to a mutual understanding. Each party comes away knowing that their views and thoughts have been fully understood. Yeah. So, how many of you people in Bob's shoes right now would be thinking some really unkind thoughts at our Scrum Master. Okay. Another one. How many people here in the room think that anything starts with, well, is a conversation that you have no desire to be anywhere near, just send you an email when you're done? <laughs> Welcome to the other side of the coin, or in some cases you're on both sides of the coin. So that's the key rub of really good communication. The way that one person likes to communicate is not always the way that the other person wants to listen. Bob likes to be thorough and accurate. He thinks before he does. He pauses to make sure he does not make mistakes. Um, he's likely to listen fully, ask lots of questions, and definitely is listening, even if he's not smiling or not responding. The Scrum Master, however, he's a different story. He's results-oriented, hard-charging, dives right in, gets the job done, takes no prisoners. And you know that he's talking to you because his eyes are like focused lasers looking right at you. 
so the question is, who is right? Who is the better communicator? The answer is neither. And if the team is not communicating, the more important part is the team is failing. So PMI, Project Management Institute, estimates that 90% of a project manager's job is communication. Now, I, I do play a project manager during the week. Um, but I think there's something wrong with that now. When I think about my job as a program manager, I can't think of anything I do that does not involve communication. If we take that to Agile, can anybody think of any part of Agile that doesn't have communication involved? <laughs> Pair programming. This is the communication equation. N equals the number of members on the team, or if you're looking at the complete project, the, num the number of people, your stakeholders. Um, it's a pretty simple bit of math when you think about it. However, it's a piece of math that we ignore at our own peril. So, the communication equation, n times n minus 1 divided by 2. It's the number of communication channels. So here we have an Agile team. The ideal Agile team is 7 people. The number of communication channels is 21. Um, I think, a second. Uh, I didn't actually don't have that math in my head. However, it is 6 individual communication channels. Each person has 6 different channels that they have to communicate with. Now, for a high-functioning Agile team, that is not an instrumental amount of communication. A high-functioning team can do it. That's great. But what happens when you have others, the stakeholders, the customer, outside parties? So first of all, let's add a second Agile team with nine people. Then we're going to add a independent Scrum Master. We're going to add the product owner. We'll add the project sponsor. A lot of customer voice. We've got to have a customer voice. Uh, we're going to have to add tech support. As has been said, I started in customer support. If you don't have tech support in the room, I don't even want to talk to you. <coughs> and of course, we also have to have those guys from IT because, well, we want to roll the system out and they tell us when we can do it and how we can do it. 22 people, 231 individual communication channels. That is an incredible amount of communication to try and get through. Even the best. Agile team is going to have problems if they don't have the right tools, if they don't understand what they're doing. You take a picture. So, what now? He's taking a picture. No. Everybody done? So, what now? If a tree falls in the woods, does it make a sound? So, philosophers have actually been asking this question for millennia. Modern science has actually proven that the answer is no. There are only sound waves. There needs to be somebody there to hear the sound waves for there to be sound. So, if you'll allow me, I am going to read from Peter Drucker's um, chapter 38 of his book on management. And I just want to make sure I get this correct, because this is Drucker. So, sound is created by perception. Sound is communication. Now this may seem trite, after all, the mystics of old already knew this, for they too always answered that there is no sound unless someone can hear it. Yet the implications of this rather trite statement are great indeed. First, it means that, there is a, that it is the recipient who communicates. The so-called communicator, the person who omits the communication, does not communicate. He utters. Unless there is someone who hears, there, hears there is no communication. There's only noise. The communicator speaks or writes or sings, but he does not communicate. Indeed, he cannot communicate. He can only make it possible or impossible for the recipient, or rather the precipient, to receive. So, given that, is it any wonder that comedians have made fun of this disconnect for years? I give you a great example of this. About a week ago, my wife and I were watching television one night. And at one point she got up, she left the room for a few minutes, and she comes back and she sits down next to me and she says, Well, we're out of toilet paper. Huh. I kept watching TV. 
Do you remember this later? She said, that's right, there's not a single piece of toilet paper in the entire house. <laughs> I kept watching TV, and you know how you can hear somebody getting mad at you? <laughs> But after a while, you can't hear the TV. You can just hear them breathing. I said, what's wrong? Nothing. Which means you got to keep asking the question until they deem you worthy of an answer. And every woman here knows where I went wrong in this little story. When she sat down next to me and she said, we're out of toilet paper, what would she actually say? Go to the store and get some toilet paper. And guys, why didn't I do it? So she didn't ask me to. That's exactly right. People communicate differently. This can be as radical as completely different languages or just the subtle nuances of different dialects or slangs from different regions or countries. So Americans in the room, small piece of advice. If an Australian ever asks you for a rubber, please hand them an eraser. <laughs> So if we all communicate differently, you need to make sure you communicate in the way that the other person will understand. Okay, great. What now? So, if you're here, I'm going to guess that you actually read the synopsis of my talk online. Because while I'd like to flatter myself and say that you came here just to listen to me, I know I'm not that good. Yeah. So, we're all here to learn about how the DISC Behavioral Profile System can make us better communicators and, by extension, better Agilists. If you're looking for the Stephen Hawking talk on the stability of black holes, it's across the quad and to the left. Okay. So, where do we start? I warned you! Exercise time. I thought about actually putting a sorting hat here, but I couldn't find a good picture. So. What I want you to do, and this is a pretty simple exercise, first of all, I want everyone to get up and move to the center of the room. Say hi to the person next to you, don't worry, none of you, none of you will bite, and you've all had shots anyway. So, while you're moving, I'll describe, the exercise is pretty simple. I'm going to flash up a series of, of words, one on either side. What I want you guys to do is you need your hands ready. When you see the words, if the word on the left side is what you identify with most, Hold up a finger on your left hand. If the word on the right side is what you identify with most, hold up the finger on your right hand. Keep track. At the end of these five, you should have a total of five fingers. Okay? Five fingers up. If you're missing fingers, uh, security's out there. They can handle her first day. Um, get some ice and try and... Okay. So, we're going to go ahead. No. So, daring and relaxed. I will re review these later, so daring and relaxed, enthusiastic, patient, persuasive, loyal, you better be doing this too, convincing, courteous, and adventure, Diplomacy. Okay. Choose your side. If you have more fingers on the left hand, that wall is your friend. Go talk to it. And you have probably guessed if you have more fingers on this side, that wall is your friend. Go talk to it. All right. So. Just to recap, so in case anybody wants to look, anybody want to change their vote? Is that your final answer? Okay, cool. Not unexpected. Not unexpected at all. Really? Really. Okay. It's just going to be what happens here that I'm curious on. So, we're going to do it again. Five fingers up at the end of this. Decisive. Gregarious. Self-assured. Team player. Accurate. Trusting. So for about a quarter of the people in the room, they're going, I'm going too slow. About a quarter of the people in the room are going, whoa, slow down. Systematic. Relaxed. Perfection. Stability. <laughs> okay. 
slightly different. More fingers on the left hand, make friends with the back. If you have more fingers on the right hand, make friends with the front. You will see pieces of paper on the wall. That's where you kind of need to be near, because at some point I'm going to ask you to actually move them. Don't move them yet. Ha! What? I love you, right? I have talked to you too much. Yeah. <laughs> no, I had to peg the first time. Okay. Although peg's a bad word. It's, I am not profiling you people. Honest. Okay, yeah, the guy in the red shirt, orange shirt. Yeah, take more. <laughs> All right. So we already got that covered. Everybody clear? You're over there or over here? Okay, just making sure. Good. See, he listens. All right. So now we have a very, very important question to ask all of you. Who are you? Are you C-3PO, Mr. Spock, <laughs> Captain Kirk, or Darth Vader? Before we get there, though, we need to look at the yardstick we're all going to be measuring you guys by. So the DISC Behavioral Profile System, just really small trivia that is not in the script. The guy who invented this also invented Wonder Woman and was the guy who came up with the first precepts for the lie detector. He's got some decent chops on multiple levels. Now that all of us actually listening to me, <laughs> it's like Wonder Woman? I'm sorry. Okay. DISC is about understanding how people communicate. It's about what behaviors they will fall back on by default. It's about uh, do they prefer short and simple answers or are they the kind of people who want to get seven layers into the architecture? How about whether they prefer starting conversations with a nice preamble, or the last thing they want to hear about is what your cat did this weekend ever? Knowing how, how the people you talk to want to listen is incredibly important. To put my own spin on Drucker's words, it's not about you, it's about them. It helps you to understand how people naturally perceive understanding that your engineering stakeholder is actually a high, high driving high D and doesn't want to see a 30 slide deck, he just wants the bottom line up front, is going to help you right up front. So, while it is all about them, um, I'm sorry, if you guys all want to, you can sit at the tables near where you are if you'd like to sit now. Or you can stay standing. Um, I'm not going to make you guys move around too much more after this unless you really want to, except for volunteers to help with the paper. Um, so while it is all about them, interestingly enough, the very first thing is that it's all about you. You need to know what your defaults are. You're going to be able to tailor your communication to fit the listener better. If you prefer detailed analysis and your boss is the next Donald Trump, you need to know that you've got to give him the bottom line up front, not a 30-page slide deck. So DISC is based off of two axes to give you a four quadrant profile. So first of all, you have assertive and reserved. Vertical axis. So assertive people are proactive and direct. They lead rather than follow and like to take immediate action whenever, whenever they can. They believe in grasping the opportunities and making their own way. Often independent and commanding, they prefer to give orders rather than take them. The people at the front of the room are the assertive people. The opposite of assertive are the reserved people. So reserved describes people who are patient and cautious. They prefer to avoid taking risks and are rarely take definitive action unless the pressure to do so is unavoidable. They dislike change or surprise and will seek calm and predictable solutions. People at the back half of the room are the reserved people. So reserved people have no problem making their point and taking control of an opportunity. Reserved people, on the other hand, are the calm in the storm, thoughtfully thinking, thinking their way through the problem. The horizontal axis goes between task-oriented people and people-oriented individuals. People, people. So, task people are practical. Uh, they're somewhat cynical in styles at times. They value hard facts and rational argument above emotional considerations. And they prefer to follow their own ideas rather than rely on other people. At times they can be distrustful and, or suspicious and they will rarely unvolunteer information about themselves. That side of the room are the task-oriented people. 
people individuals are quite often individuals are friendly, trusting, and ingenuous. They express themselves easily and have strong relationships. People individuals tend to work on an emotional level, re reveling in their feelings and reacting to those around them. So, task people may remove their emotions from the equation. That does not mean they are not really effective. And then people are willing to put themselves out for the team or their friends and will respond to events with emotion. This are the people people. Oh, so, I just want to make sure I'm in the right. Okay, so, this gives us four quadrants. You combine the two axes, you get four quadrants. So the first are high D, dominance, direct, strong willed, forceful. Ready, fire! <coughs> they don't have time to aim. The high I is for influence. People high in this value are sociable, talkable, and lively. Ready, aim, say after this, you want to go out for drinks? The high S is for steadiness. People high in this value are gentle, accommodating, and soft hearted. Is everyone ready to aim? <laughs> the C is for conscientious. People high in this value are private, intellectual, and logical. Ready, aim, aim, aim. These four profiles basically make up the, the um, basic of, of DISC. It's all we need to worry about right now. We're going to focus on the, the basics, what you are, and how you can communicate to others of other profiles. So, sorry. Um, I think we talked about this before, of who you are. Um, so, the high D will be represented by Darth Vader. Captain Kirk is the high I. Mr. Spock is the high C. And C-3PO is the high S. If I can get somebody to remove the page number one from the wall, we will reveal who you guys are. Now, I'm betting the high C's already know this all because they've been keeping track. We're doing this for the high I's though because they're still back on the snowboard and trying to figure out if my ties go with snow boots. Just pull it up and you can take, just take it off the wall. There you go. Um, I've taken this percentage test before and I'm D and I, so somehow the question was, I'm not really sure. Yeah, it's not, it, it is not perfect. So if you're D and I, if you would like to move to the D table, you can. But I'm just saying that uh, yes. I, I want to know where did you pick and select the question because I'm not really sure if they really helped us identify the right personality type. So I actually took the disk, the, 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 the page on disk where it shows all the, the, the words that identify you and I went with the name, the values that were high. It isn't perfect to do it this way in the sorting, so it's not perfect. Um, it's going to have some, some, some room for error. I highly recommend everybody take the disk test. Yeah. However, um, based on some of the stuff I'm seeing, um, I'm, I'm pretty ha happy. One of the things you will find and as you read more about this is high D tends to can be bred in. Managers tend to express more high D. And this is also, how are you in work? versus how are you at home. If I take this test at home, I'm going to have a completely different result than if I take this test at work. It's actually no surprise, I'm standing between the high D and the high I. At work, my work profile is a screaming high D, high I. I, I, I swing between storm the hill and, hey, how about those nets? At home, I'm probably strictly a high I. Actually, I think my wife wouldn't let me be anything other than a high I. So, are you Darth Vader? Do you like to make quick decisions and want immediate results? Do you like to take charge? Do people who answer questions with, well, make your head explode? Have you ever been advised to use more caution or accused of being insensitive? Have you ever been advised to slow down and relax more? Yes. Then you might be a high D. Please drink two Coronas and call the team in the morning. Now, anybody want to move? So, um, if somebody can take the, the Darth Vader and move him to the side, same with Mr. Spock, C-3PO, and Cap Well, actually, sorry, just Darth Vader right now. We'll do it as we move around the, court, around the room. Just pull that off. There's two sheets because I didn't want you guys reading through. So, high Ds. You are strong-willed individuals who prioritize results. You want to be recognized for your ability so that you are constantly looking for new challenges. You can come off as overly competitive, you know that's just your determination to be the best and to succeed. 
Yoda doesn't have to tell you there is no do, no, no try only do, because you've already done it. Run five miles, are drinking an espresso, and about to go off to save the world, whether it wants to be saved or not. Under pressure, your default is to action. When not under pressure, your default is to action. The last thing you want is for someone to over-explain things to you. The Marines coined the term bottom line up front just for you. Um, obstacles are unneeded delays and a risk better be huge for you to even think about slowing down. You've got no issues with someone being just as forceful as you. Finally, someone who gets it. Others would describe you as quick to anger. You would say, I'm not angry, I just want things to do the work the right way. My way. So, high D communication. How do they say the words? So, let me back up a second. Interactions are defined by behaviors. Behaviors are the words we say, how we say them, our facial expressions, our body language, and our work product. Work product being things like, is it on time? Is it neat? Is it accurate? And the disc profile exceptions, are, disc profiles are no exception. Each profile has its own set of distinctive behaviors. High D words are very focused on I and you. Abbreviations and titles, not names, quite often tend to depersonalize their communications. They are the ultimate detail-oriented project manager, always focused on who does what by when. And their speech is louder and faster. They get right to the point, even if that requires interrupting you to get to it. Their face and body follow right behind. Body space is not big for a high D. And, they're, and between that and their laser-like eye contact, they quite often come, even come off as intimidating or angry. So, how do you talk to a high D? One of the things we'll talk, I want to cover also is meetings and email. Meetings, stand-up meetings. Yes, they're perfect. No wasted time and everybody's just to the point. Emails, emails are great. I can get right to the point, and I don't have to worry about anything like putting in names or signing it, because, I mean, they know who the email's from, because that's from the, in the front line, and I don't have to address them, because they know that I'm talking to them, because they're in the two line. And it, it, if you see an email from a high D that's more than four lines, he's not feeling well. So, when you're talking to a high D, the rest of you in the room, you need to brief, brief them to the point. You need to stay on topic. You need to not waste their time. And you need to be clear about rules and expectations. You have to understand that when a high D communicates, they're going to be blunt. They're going to be looking for a challenge. They're going to be looking for results. They're going to be looking for the bottom line. So, are you Mr. Spock? Does the question, what is, what is, what is a swimming pool full of instruction manuals? Is the answer to you a good start? Have you ever said, Check me in 27 moves and meant it. When someone answers a question with whatever, we'll figure it out. Do you want to sit on them until they agree to a detailed plan of action? Have you been accused of being a lifeless automaton? Have you been accused of being emotionless and thought that was a compliment? Then you just might be a high C. Please Google, I'm, please Google feeling emotions and hit the I'm feeling lucky button. So, high C's, you value accuracy over almost anything else. Your pursuit of accuracy allows you to set aside emotions to keep focused. When you have all the facts, you don't think you're right, you know you're right because the facts prove it. Um, accuracy is one of the things that helps you to maintain stability, which is something else that you really, really care about. Combined, this means you don't tend to move quickly and you dislike it when others force you into what you often think of as a rash decision. This all leads to you to loving challenge and finding ways to improve or make the most streamlined of methods. A well-oiled machine is perfection itself. So when under pressure or not, your default is to questions. When faced with the unknown, you want to understand it. First, at the fork in the road, you don't take the left or the right fork. You climb the tree and get a complete lay of the land before you make a single decision. There is no such thing as information overload for a high C. Others might accuse you of being fussy of over minor issues. You would probably remind them that a one degree er um, error in the moon mission would have resulted in the missing the target by thousands and thousands. Okay, 
I'm clearly not a high seat. You'd be able to give the exact, exact number of miles. Um, so, how do you communicate with them? On the right slide. Yes, okay. I see words focus on asking questions or delivering instructions. When they talk with quiet pre precision and quite often they prepare it ahead of time. Um, while they don't smile um, as much, they'll, um, while they don't smile much, and their lack, um, their lack of eye contact makes them seem more aloof and shy than the predatory ID smile. So, talking to the high C, first of all, meetings. Great, I can get everybody in a room and we can go through the product spec line by line. Finally, everybody will know that I'm right and I can just get the job done. Emails. Emails are perfect for attaching attachments. Now, of course, I'm going to have to give a detailed explanation of what's in the attachments inside of the email. The high D's head just explode. Um, so, if you're a high C, you need to be clear, you need to be dependable, you need to be quiet sometimes. Uh, yeah? No. Yeah. Sorry. High C's are going to double check everything. They want clear expectations, and they want you to be businesslike. They want you to be businesslike. So, are you C3PO? Do you have no room on your desk because of all of the photographs or trash keys or whatever? Um, do little old ladies pass you? This one's not the best in the world. Do little old ladies pass you in the hallway muttering how slow you are? Do uh, earth tones and muted black describe your wardrobe? Would you rather hold your opinion rather than see the team in discord? Does the idea of your boss calling you in front of the entire division to give you an award make you want to find the deepest, darkest hole to hide in? Then you might be a high S. Please take a line dancing class and talk to this perfect stranger next to you. So, high S's. Nothing makes you happier than helping others. Next to loyalty in the dictionary, oh I'm sorry, you can pull that and you can pull that one there too. Nothing makes you happier than helping others. Next to loyalty in the dictionary, your face could be seen. That is, if you weren't so modest as to not want to take credit. Um, you're a great listener and you probably know more about the team than some of the spouses of the team do. Uh, what you really care about is stability. You don't like it when people move your cheese, not that you would say anything. You avoid conflict and will happily discount your own opinion to do so. The saying, an artist is their own worst critic, just tells you that the best artists are, of course, high S's. Now, under pressure, you tend to pull back. The last thing you want to do is see conflict. You'd rather bury your opinions than bring about conflict. You're probably starting to question your own position anyway, out of, uh, um, because the tension tends to enhance your own self-doubt. Now, out of a pressure situation, your go-to response is to sit down and talk. All the world's problems can be solved with a good conversation and a cup of tea. Some accuse you of having no self-esteem self -esteem or team worth, to which you're going to argue, I'm here for the team. The team is all that matters. So, high S communication. They will use who and we when talking to make sure everyone is included. When they do talk, it will be slower and softer than the hard charging D. They tend to make communication personal and positive. Physically, they're like the C with the small gestures. They often, they differ though in that they will smile and focus on the speaker, even if they can't make the same strong eye contact that a high D can. So talking to the high S. First of all, meetings. Oh, meetings are a great place to observe and to listen and to think. What, what, wait, wait, me speak? No, 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 thank you. Not in a meeting. Emails, they're a little lacking in emotion. Still, it can be a good way to exchange information. And it's a lot easier to raise an issue in email than it is to raise it in person. As a high S, you need to be sincere. You need to, um, if you, sorry, if you talk to a high S, you need to be sincere. You need to not embarrass them. You need to brief them on changes early. You need to be nice. Realize that a high, C, high S is going to resist change. They are going to have problems with prioritizing. They want security. They want process. Most important, they want private recognition. Talk to them in private if you really like what they did. 
they must drop to embarrass them. <coughs> so are you Captain Kirk? Do the terms, ooh, shiny and squirrel, describe your attention span? I'm making fun of myself here, by the way, people. Do you have more, do you use more emoticons and actual words in your email? Does everything remind you of a story that you've got to tell people right now? Is your designer shirt ironed so crisp that you can get a paper cut? Is your idea of getting the job done usually involve finding out who can help you with it? And is there always time to do the job later? Um, do the song lyrics, I want to talk about I, I want to talk about me, I want to talk about number one, sound like your personal mantra? Then you might be a high I. Sit down, shut up, and let the other person talk about the mathematical properties of blue for a while. So, high eyes. And yes, again, I'm making fun of myself. <laughs> Exciting, enthusiastic, energetic, electrified, eager, engaged are your personal mantras. You love to be out there engaged with the team, the customer, the guy you just met in the coffee shop. You want to trust everyone and you want to be trusted by everyone. You love to start new projects, and the thrill of a new idea is like electricity straight to your brain. Only you need to bring an extension cord, because you tend to fade quickly, and your ability to finish projects you started is much lower than the number of projects you started. Like the high D, your default is to action, only it tends to be lights, camera, action. You love being out there and engaging with everyone. If you haven't talked to a half a dozen people by the time you get to your cube in the morning, there is something wrong. Um, your first instinct is to trust everyone you meet and giving them the benefit of the doubt. Under pressure, you just get bigger. A wall of words will cover any sin, right? Unfortunately, you also become un unorganized and you'll easily start dropping things until you don't even remember to put on an iron shirt. Now, people often do come up to you and say, decaf. To which your response is, decaf's for wimps. I'm this energetic natural. So, high eye communication. High eyes love I. I did. I am. I will. I love. They will focus on who over what, and they will happily fill the void with talking, um, which they will do fast, continuous, and with healthy exaggeration. Now, honesty was this big. Really, this. You won't be able to miss them because they are, they put their entire body into talking and everything, and they're constantly in motion, and they'll have excellent eye contact until squirrel. Oh, where was that? So, what do you need to do to talk to a high eye? First of all, how do high eyes feel about meetings and about, about emails? Meetings. Man, if it isn't highly focused with a detailed agenda, I'm going to be on my iPhone within five minutes. Emails. Wow, these emoticons are almost like being there. Hey, hey, hey did you know that you could embed YouTube links into your email? Ooh, shiny. So when you're talking to a high eye, you need to be informal. You've got to be relaxed. You've got to listen to their feelings, even if it's going to make your head explode. Um, you've got to be cool, dude. Understand that when you're talking to a high eye, they're going to overestimate ability, oversell, overshadow C's and S's. Generally, over the top. So, any questions? I tend to talk in a mile a minute. Yes? Um, is this been validated across culturally? As a matter of fact, it has. Um, I reference manager tools a lot. I believe in manager tools. If you haven't listened to manager tools podcast, I swear by them. They actually have a podcast called The Wimby Curve. It's one of, their, one of the people there. She spent a lot of time with DISC, and she actually started analyzing DISC results, because they do, they do um, conferences around the world, started collating the DISC results, and they started laying out the bell curves. Bell curves were almost identical across countries. Manager tools, I'm not 100% with them yet. However, manager tools basically maintains that cultural differences are not the factor you need to work on. You need to work on the factor of what are the individual communication styles. Um, you can sometimes we'll see more of a communication style in certain environments, but they find that in on average, you will get the same number of disc profiles in each country around the world. I was kind of stunned on that. Yes. So you mentioned you probably have a different profile of work to at home. Yes. Is there any literature on having a different profile for a different context of work? 
Um, not that I've seen. I've actually, being a double, a high D, high I, one of the things I've found is when I receive an email, I tend to want to want a crisp email. And I've actually trained people I've worked with to give me the bottom line up front. When I write emails, oh my God, they're like novels. So it's, I, I tend to express differently depending on what I do. And so I have to just be very conscious. So I, I've got to really be aware when I'm writing emails to my boss, who is a screaming high C. I've got to be very factual as opposed to work, working out the emotions, which I tend to run on when I'm running a program team. So I've worked in a large organization where the Ds gravitate towards the top, and they like yep. Ds. And every time they ran into any one of the other colors, they, they tended to overwhelm them with lots of logical reasons why they weren't good at management personalities, which really turned into a self-fulfilling prophecy of buds and bees, you know, all chiefs and no Indians, right? If there was nobody who would step in. I just found it just another way where you could form a little boys club if you've identified that I'm a D, I like these, I don't want to be around by anybody else with these, and shove all the other personalities out of that. Right, so unfortunately that, it, it can be a high a tendency of the Ds. The thing you've got to remember is, going back to this, is none of these profiles is right or wrong. And in fact, they have found, and it goes back to there being hard data on it, the best high-performing teams have got a good mix of all of the pers of, of profile types. Um, so it's, it is really important. Yes, unfortunately, um, salespeople and um, business leaders tend to gravitate toward high D. Part of it is, Management in itself breeds you to be more high D. So again, part of it is you look at your work profile, and it's like, are you a high D because you're 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 a manager of work, or are you a high D because that's really what your 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 fallback is? For me, for example, I am a high D at work because I have learned to be a high D because I work in Silicon Valley as a project manager. Most likely, if I were to take this and I was just thinking like I, at, at 20 or just thinking in my home life completely, I'd probably come off as a high I, possibly even leaning towards a high S, just because it's how I'm different at home. I think it's, it's it's very fair for people to understand that most of us will have different, uh, pretty much all of us will have multiple flavors. Like you said, there will be probably right. two more uh, dominant personality types. And the second thing is, I think one thing that I've learned about these personality types is that please don't use this as color benchmark. So this just this is just to give you a high level idea to evaluate people in your level of communication. But this is not how you get completely profile. Otherwise, you run into other issues. So if you really start going by this book and start looking at, oh, is it a D I should talk to him, then you'll actually run into these. Right. Again, this is about knowing if, I mean, one of the things here is, as a project manager slash scrum master slash agilist, one of the things I absolutely believe in is that it is up to you to be the good communicator. So understand what your profile is, and so you can communicate with that other person. As much as it drives me bonkers, I go and I sit down with my high S's and I talk small and I talk about the team and I'm really relaxed and I'm really calm when all I want them to do is just give me the freaking status report so I can get on with my day. When I'm dealing with high C's and they start talking to me about you know, all this day to day and everything, it's like, dude, can't we just go have a beer? But I know that I've got to communicate in the way that my team is going to understand. And in fact, actually, that's a very good segue. Um, we'll get, if you still have your question after my segue. So, I want to give you a real world example of me using D. First of all, I'm as, um, I forgot your name. Camera? Cam My? Yeah, your name. Camera? Camera. So he was talking about that. One of the things you've got to remember that your score, if you take the disc, I prefer the number number one. They've got two different models now. One's just these like colored bubbles or whatever. You get a, you get a, you get, um, you get a score from one to seven. Anything over a five is considered a high. So I am a seven, seven, three, one. So you just gotta be aware of your entire per personality. So when it comes to data, oh forget it, I, I, don't, I don't give a rat's to you. I've learned how to deal with it because I gotta survive in Silicon Valley. I actually have a fairly strong lean. That's why I think I might actually, at home, I might be a high S, high I. Whereas the high D, I've just learned, I'm surviving in Silicon Valley, I've got to be that way. Um, just so you know, this is not, Counterproductive to Myers-Briggs. Myers-Briggs is more about what is your first formative years and kind of what is your built-in sociology. However, as an example, this kind of makes me look like an, a screaming extrovert. I'm actually a raging introvert. I kind of peg out so high on the introvert you can't get much more, more off the scale. When I get home tonight, I'm just going to be pff, wasted. 
So, I used DISC to get a job in 2009. Anybody remember 2009? Not exactly a great year. So I'd been laid off, I was out of work at the time. I got an interview in a job industry that I had absolutely no experience in. Never worked in that industry, and it was a very, very specific industry that really, really cared about, about subject matter knowledge. So I got the list of who I was going to interview with. I went out to LinkedIn, I looked at everybody's LinkedIn profile, and based on their LinkedIn profile, and my understanding of DISC, I developed a guess on what their personality, what their DISC profile was. I then went back to Manager Tools. We've talked about Manager Tools. Um, Manager Tools has a whole bunch of podcasts. They have one podcast for every profile of how to introduce to that, that profile. So I then used the, that technique and I introduced to each of these different profiles in the way that I, in the profile I thought they were. Of the five people, four of them I got dead on. The fifth one, I, 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 I figured out an introduction and adjusted right away. So when I was interviewing with the high S, I was talking quiet. I sat back, I had very small gestures. I focused on the team and helping. When I was talking with the high D, I leaned forward, I was forceful, I was direct. I didn't have a problem interrupting him, and my handshake was rock solid firm. So I ended up getting the job. When my manager talked to me after I'd been hired, he said every single person had given me a thumbs up. Every single person. I, again, I had no, no experience in this industry, yet everybody thought that I was going to help make the team better. And I did. That's another story. Um, so that's a practical use of DISC that I use. And it wasn't like mind, mind magic or whatever. I did no Je Jedi mind tricks, I, pr I, I promise. So, um, I'm going to do a little summary here. If there's any questions, um, um, I'm happy to answer them. But why don't I do the summary in that way? I don't have a question, but I wanted to say you might be either D, I, S, or C. But you should, as a project manager or scrum master, you should learn how to deal with other personalities. Exactly. If you are in a leadership role, a project management role, a manager role, or a scrum master role, again, it's not about you, it's about them. You have to learn to communicate in the style they want. I mean, I think Olaf can talk about the last time we were at, at a conference, I kept making sure that you had time to talk in the, in, in, at the table we had, because there were a lot of really, really energetic D's and I's at the table, and I saw Olaf, and he was just sitting there, and he was really quiet. I could tell he had some stuff. I just would turn him and go, Olaf, what do you think? And he had some wonderful gems. So, let me do this and then I'll take any questions. So, how to be a better high X. If you're a high D, learn to smile more. Now, you might want to practice this in front of a mirror so you don't come off like a lion about to eat its next dinner. Let them finish talking. I like to use the one breath rule. When the other person finishes talking, that is when they stop making sound, not when you think they have nothing left to say. <laughs> then you take one complete breath before you talk. High C's. You also need to smile more. Only with you, the practice is more to make it not look like a cardboard cutout. <coughs> also, if you're here in Agile, you've probably already conquered this, but be willing to accept 80%. As we know, 60% of software code never gets used anyway. That last 20% is not worth the damage it will do to your relationships. So accept 80%. High S's. Make, uh, I knew I forgot to update something. Take a stand. Don't go with the flow. Have an opinion and stick to it. The team will respect you more. Um, don't pry. A good percentage of the team does not want to tell you their life story. If you're getting a lot of one-word answers, it's time to stop. Okay, high eyes. Task lists. You can't remember it all. You're too busy trying to remember that joke you just heard. Write it down and follow up. And then, put your hands down. Hell, put them in your pockets. When you make those big gestures, there are some people in the room that think you're going to hit them. Honest. So, any questions? Well, could you go back to the slide before your job tip? What does the overshadow C's and S's mean? Um, high eyes. Oh, it's the profiles. Yeah, the profile. Oh, all right. They basically uh, high eyes. If they're not paying attention, they're going to just blow through. They're going to be talking. They have no problem throwing stuff out. High D's are similar. They they have no problem. High D's can be having a conversation in a meeting. 
and the high S's think that they need to call the cops because they're about to get ha have it out. Or the high D's are just going, no, we're just having a conversation. We're getting getting to the bottom. Bottom. So that's what it is. Is then generally the assertive people, assertive people in the room will tend to overshadow, and so they're the assertive people in the room have to work even doubly harder because the high C's and the high I's, high S's are going to not interrupt. They're going to not talk. That doesn't mean that they're not pissed off at you. Are you familiar with a uh, profile called Mind Time? And so any thoughts on it? No, not familiar with it. Um, there's a lot. Disk is, goes all the way back to like the 30s. So there have been. It's very old. I mean, it's as almost as old as Myers Briggs. There have been a lot of stuff that has been basically they've taken either Myers Briggs or Disk and they have built off of it. Um, I just I I I found this to be very useful. One of the things is again, it's the kind of thing where you can you can use it in a real world environment. Unlike say Myers Briggs, I couldn't tell you if Olaf is an extrovert or an introvert, and it really doesn't matter. I can tell you that I always thought Olaf was a high was a high S. Um, it's just his his style. Some of the ways he said it was he was a high C or high high S, and I always thought of him more as a high S just because of how he asked questions and how he reacted to, to things dealing with team dynamics and such. And do you think that this is this personalities and profiles are predicted in other ways besides communication styles? Yes and no. The thing you have to understand is DISC is environmentally ba based. I mean, your DISC is not... Myers-Briggs has to do with basically... Myers-Briggs is, what was your first five years like? What was your nurture versus nature um, um, time, time like when you, were, when you were a child? And it fundamentally does not change after that. And in fact, there are people who said, well, yeah, my Myers-Briggs changed. And it's like, no, I think it's how you think about it, and you're overthinking taking the test. DISC, um, I took this four years ago, and I was a... Um, I was a 5-7-3-1. Uh, I took it again just last year, and I pegged out at a 7 7 three, one. And I'm not surprised, because I'm working in even more intense environments and having to be more driving to get things done. Any questions from the IDs? That's all I've got, folks. Um, so let's see. Uh, so as I kind of say in my personal mantra, I think DISC is not, so DISC is not the be-all and end-all of communication. Not at all. I think it will help you become a better communicator. And a better communicator will make you a better agilist. And to me, I think that that will lead to a better world. Because I fundamentally believe that better individuals make better team members. That better team, maker, team members make better projects. Better projects lead to better products. Better products lead to better businesses. And better businesses will lead to a better, better world. So we as individuals can make a better world. My personal belief. Um, I will probably update this and send it to you because I've made a couple of minor corrections. But these are references. Um, the disk wiki entry, if you want all the, the, the hard, hard science data that, that backs up that this actually is really um, something and not just fluffy. Um, then uh, Inkscape Publishing is the number one disk um, provider out there. Uh, ManagerTools.com has a great resource of podcasts on disk. I think they have got probably 20, 30 dip podcasts at least. Um, if you want to know what your disk profile is, um, I recommend Manager Tools hosts it at 2695. It's the cheapest one I found out there, and it goes right to Inkscape Publishing. They use the use, use the gold standard. And then uh, the last one is actually a fan created um, uh, explorer for Manager Tools podcasts because finding that. Their search engine on their site isn't always the greatest. So you can go there and just look for disk, and you'll see all the disk um, podcasts sorted out. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I'd like to ask on the way out, can you please? Uh...